All right, excellent. Let me share what I have with you. All right. Our circle of solidarity and mourning. Welcome, everyone. Glad you can be here. This is a summons to prayer and a call to action. Um, found this from a so-called list for 13 ways to learn and show up as an anti-racist in this world, compiled by Jen Okoff. So, um, Sister Mary Jean, would you like to read this for us? Systemic racism is baked into America. It's so baked in that as a white person, I often don't see it. It has taken me years of deep listening, learning, and unlearning to see just how baked in it is. And even still, I have plenty of blind spots and more growth to do. All right. Yeah, so it's big. It's baked into everything. Um, and it's hard for us to grasp hold of. And actually, it's something we need to continually learn about throughout our lives. So we have been saying their names in this circle of mourning and solidarity. So we add a few more names today. And I found this nice graphic. And it's say her name today. So these are four young women, unfortunately, that lost their lives. Two of them, Sandra Bland and Rakia Boyd, might have heard their names. They have ties to Chicago. Um, Sandra Bland was really in the news a lot. Her family really pushed to find out the truth of her death. Um, she grew up in Naperville and um, went to school, went to college down in Texas. And she was, I think, visiting down there. She had already graduated and moved back to Chicago for some years, but was down there for some reason when she was pulled over for a traffic stop and um, ended up dying in jail a few days later. Um, and at first they said it was suicide, but, um, you know, we still don't really know for sure, I guess, from what I understand. The family claims that's not true. She was only in her early 20s when she died. Same with Rakia Boyd, who was in a park with three other friends when she was killed by a police, off-duty police officer. Elisa Thomas. Um, I believe was from Los Angeles, and Chantel Davis from New York, and they died at the hands of police. So we remember their lives today. What I wanted to talk about a little bit more today was structural racism in our society, how it's baked into our social structure. Sorry, this is a little bit hazy here, not clear, um, the graphic itself, but um, you can see in the middle, our social and economic system relates to education, health, employment, communities, housing, and criminal justice. Um, and there is uh, structural racism in all these parts of our society and economy. Structural racism framing narratives. This is um, just a few points um, from a training I had a few years ago and um, worked with one of my organizers to boil it down to these points. So like a weekend training and um, so it could take a long time to unpack it all. Um, 
but I keep going back to these points myself to help remind me of what structural racism is and that you know we talk about people being racist or doing racist things um, but I think it's even more helpful to remember that racism is structural in our society and and this is how it continues on without us even knowing or recognizing it. Um, Jane, would you be willing to read these points for us? Structural racism framing narratives. Structural racism does not exist to hurt people of color, though it surely does that. Structural racism exists to enrich corporations and institutions of the 1%. Structural racism regularly exploits, excludes, underserves, and oppresses people of color. Structural racism self-perpetuates and self-corrects without individuals helping it to. Structural racism exists in every American institution until it's disrupted. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, so um, there's different ways to talk about structural racism, but um, you know, this is one way that reminds us that um, you know, it, it exists basically as a way of um, structuring our society and especially how that enriches uh, certain people and uh, corporations in our society. Um, you know, and we could look at the ways that this happened, how it all was all set up if we looked historically at our country, right? So you can tie this all the way back to um, slavery days, the days of slavery when um, people were arrested from their homes in another continent to come over and um, serve our economy. Um, when Africans were brought here and forced uh, to uh, provide free labor for our country. You know, and that turned into Jim Crow, and that still exists in all of our institutions in silent uh, ways that exploit, exclude, underserve, and oppress people of color. And, you know, a lot of white people will say, well, I'm not a racist, you know, I, I don't want to hurt people of color and yet we know that this kind of racism self-perpetuates and self-corrects and continues to happen without us individually uh, doing it but it's baked into the whole system so right. yes go ahead michael can you take us to question to statement one and, and go a little deeper in that because I'm struggling with, with number one. I, I number two, three, four, five, uh, all uh, fit and make sense. Um, but that first salient point to say structural racism does not exist to hurt people of color. I, it sent a very sharp uh, wound into my heart to hear that. When, when every point below it states what that structural racism is uh, and its intentionality and its formation uh, to hurt people of color and to say that it doesn't, it really cuts core to me. So can you, I mean, I, maybe, we, maybe we may need to unpack that privately, but I'm just confused by that particular salient point, knowing what you, even what you just said at the end around structural racism being a, system of of enslaving africans to come to this country to do work at uh uh and to put them on these farms in the middle of the heat to give them very little water to give them poor housing 
to not allow them to have education, to not allow the only thing they could read was possibly the Bible, which they had to struggle to learn how to do that on their own. So the, the, the whole system just struggles with me to hear, to hear this. Uh, training was intimating that structural racism was not intended to hurt um, when its whole premise is to control uh, and to hurt, I, in my mind. So did, did, was there more in-depthness to that, to justify that statement? Because that one I struggle with. Reverend Ware, I second that. I, I had the same uh, kind of moral, emotional dissonance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just came from a training, so I'm, I'm really interested to hear, uh, Fred, what you took away from, from, from uh, that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, I apologize for that sharp pain that you felt. Well, and, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So, I mean, the training that I received and um, so I think their main point is that it does exist to enrich people, that it was set up as an economic system. And so, um, you know, it, it surely does hurt people of color, but its purpose is to, um, you know, set up a system of hierarchy um, so that uh, those people um, can benefit from that system. And so, yeah, I mean, certainly we know that all those things that you talked about, Michael, happened and um, people were, you know, more than just hurt. <laughs> yeah, they were killed. Yeah. They were destroyed, right? You yeah. know, and um, but the purpose of structural races, the purpose of, you know, white supremacy, maybe a better word, is is, um, you know, in the sense that they almost didn't care about those black lives and those black bodies, just like George Floyd's black body was still, you know, that person didn't care to do what he did to him, even today in our own time. That's happened throughout the history to prop up this system of, of white supremacy to enrich people and to keep them on top and to keep them dominant. That's what the system is designed to do. Certainly, as a person of color, you know, you feel all the hurt and it, um, I can imagine perhaps that, you know, that is, feels like the design of the system because that, but there, I think they're saying that's the result of it. And that's, you know, yeah. I, I would, I would, I would say the system that was, that was, that we have the biblical system of, of enslavement, uh, where you could buy yourself out or take yourself away, or um, that would, that would make, I, I guess I would say that would probably fit more. But the, but the, but the structural racism of the United States, from the point of bringing over enslaved Africans was never that system anymore. Once, once that system, it, it may have been that system for, for, for white enslavement, which there was at a time for indentured white servants, if you, if you go back prior to slavery. There yeah. was that, that was that brought over through Europe into the, the United States before it was formed. But once that went away, once it became the structural racism that you described on your design there, with all of those elements, it wasn't. It has been and always in my mind. And I'm not going to push you back in your training, but I'm going to say in my mind, it has always been from from a colored black person's uh, perspective. It has always been a racism to hurt. It has never been a racism to build up to lift. It was built up, as you say, to lift up white people. Yes, but that wasn't race. That wasn't the racism. That was just outright power and authority and control. Racism is the actual power over, an, over another group of people. And to me, this structural racism around the enslaved African, 
from the inception has always been, we can bring them over, we can do whatever we want to. We were always considered property. We were never considered a human face. So I'm not gonna push any further. I just would challenge that, and I think it would be challenged, but I'm glad you showed it because it does say to me, wow, if a training was done five years ago or six years ago, and this statement were across the board, and I was sitting in that space, I would be like, oh no, this would be a hard thing because what this is basically giving before it ever starts is a pass to white people to say, well, you didn't intend to hurt us. Well, you no, know, that's not true. But anyway, so I'll stop there. Thank you. May, may I? Um, I, 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 I can co concur that the hurt is, um, the hurt is beyond measure. I, I was not at this training. I don't know what this training um, was trying to say. But one of the things that, that I've experienced is some training around the idea of dividing people to mm. serve the economic system. Yeah. And that um, certainly if, I mean, we're t like in the second bullet about the 1%, if the 99 really rose up against the 1% or if the, if, if, if we, if we were able to mobilize people in this country to really seek economic justice, but one of the tools that's been used and it's been used since reconstruction to divide people has been the color of skin has been around religion, has been mm. around any opportunity to other. And mm. so, you know, well, you're not like them. So you, you know, wouldn't, I mean, it, so, so I, I think that those efforts at division, like have been really truly intentional um, mm. because if people do band together, um, that poses that poses a threat and i've um you know i've long believed that when dr king got involved in issues around poverty and really arguing for um for poor people whatever their color that that was a really significant threat that exacerbated the threat that he already posed. Um, I mean, and that's, I mean, I'm only speaking for myself there, but I, I think that there has been a really intentional reality in this country for all that we talk about freedom, for all that we talk about um, to divide. Mm. Mm. Th thank you. Uh... Thank you all. This is a powerful uh, moment, and it's important for us to really mm -hmm. dive into the words and to make sure that we can make sense of the words and, and what the words um, convey or intend to convey. And I, I would say, um, inspired by you, Reverend Ware, and you, Dr. Steinfels, um, Pastor Kinsey, I'm glad that you brought this to bear. Um, yes. Yes. Powerful conversation. Yes. Uh, I, I would say in this list, right, thinking about it as an educator, thinking at, about it as a, a clergy person uh, responsible to convey moral, religious meaning. Um, I'm I'm struggling to uh, reconcile the third bullet point hmm. which speaks of regular exploitation and oppression with the first bullet point that indicates, well, this oppression, this exploitation is not really meant mm. to hurt people. C clearly there's a, a disconnect between those two and, and mm. love to meet the teacher. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, there's such an emotional reaction. So any, any kind of intellectual academic parsing out of these statements may not be, um, True, true. Emotionally satisfying. 
Mm. My guess is, um, uh, that there's probably some guilt in number one. Mm. Some white guilt that says, look, you know, maybe I can assuage my conscience if I put this all in an economic framework. It's just the economic facts of life and allowed me to engage in the practice of slavery. Uh, and this wasn't to hurt anybody. This was to maximize economic benefit. So it wasn't personal. Well, that, that you can say if you're white and you hold all the power, if you're on the receiving end of that and you actually do feel exploited and you do feel uh, oppressed, then it's only an excuse here for bad behavior. And that's what makes it so difficult to, 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 to rec not only just reconcile, but to, 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 to understand, right? How can we talk about oppression, but say, well, it's not really meant to hurt. And, and I think this is important for our conversation because we have to, if we're going to be anti-racist, we really have to look at our language and look at the ambivalence and the guilt. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to hear that and absorb it. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't think it was meant to give white people a pass. That would be horrible. Mm. So I'm feeling that. And um, yeah, I'm going to sit with that for a while. Thank so. you, Fred, for the, Fred, but thank you for bringing this, this piece because it, it, it is what we need to talk about. And yeah, we weren't part of the, tra I wasn't part of the training, so I don't know right. what I, I don't, I can't, you know, and this is five years ago. So to say what was all of the groundwork around it, I don't know either. Um, but I'm just saying, reading it five years, reading an, a synopsis five years later, uh, with this language does, as, you, as you've already heard, it does bring up some questions. And I think that's going to happen with all of us with material that we bring, that it will bring up discussion. And where we go with it is, a, is, a, is another thing. But it just... It does. It's going to surface up some stuff. And I think that's the good part about this. And so I hope you don't take it on to yourself. You're just presenting to us what you, uh, what you gleaned from the training, what, what was being said, some overall themes, and you had not acknowledge that early on. But uh, so I do accept that. I just, I'm just responding because as I read what may have been said or what may have been espoused, it brings up some stuff within me that says I, I, I would have wanted to be like Rabbi Moran said, I would have wanted to be part of that training or to hear that speaker to, to kind of just get a sense. I mean, and, and maybe there was a book that was from this specific training that may elaborate mm -hmm. even more. Uh, but yeah, it, 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 this is, this is what we're, this is what we want to do. We want to get ourselves into this state of questioning uh, because that's what we tend to not do anyway. So thank you for doing it. Thank you for that. Yeah, <clears throat> and I think Jane was on to something, and and Michael, you pointed to it as well about the um, uh, the the one percent and the the trying to divide us. You know that that was a part of the training too. And you know, go back to that uh, the Bacon Rebellion in the seventeen hundreds, and and um, that's when basically like the ninety nine percent, you could say the the working people um, rebelled together against their owners to um, get better conditions. And that Bacon Rebellion that was used to, um, was one of the first wedges of creating uh, racism and separating uh, working people black from white. Mm. Yeah, so that they, you know, whites became more like a servant class and blacks became slaves and there was a real social distinction made and so 
in that, you know, and you can kind of see how that's played out and that, um, you know, it privileges white people and, and separates us to today, you know, that we're, um, white people are blind to the, to the differences and, and, um, and more and more we've been uh, conditioned to, to see um, racism in our institutions as, as normalized. So, yeah, so instead of working together to end racism, we continue to let it happen. Mm. Fred, uh, uh, nothing but respect uh, for you and, and, and our conversation today. And I think that it's inevitable that we get into conversations that really challenge us. In fact, mm. I would think if it was just a show and tell experience, then we wouldn't really be um, mm. developing a real call to action because a call to action really requires us to dive in deeply. Uh, one thing that could come of this right, as we're kind of grappling over uh, the language of a particular training that you found valuable enough to bring to our attention, what sort of training do we need to yes. engage yes. going forward? Mm -hmm. Because uh, our debate here really is around uh, mm -hmm. uh, a set of teachings mm -hmm. that uh, you know, we should all have, in a sense, uh, our own personal firsthand witness of right? True. Because who's to say, right, that um, the training itself doesn't possess uh, a certain bias? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't mean to be gratuitously critical of the training. Right. I just right. think no. that look at this very rich and no. intense no. conversation came out of it. Uh, I, I would believe that a good teacher will stir up this kind of conversation so that we can mm -hmm. really talk deeply um, about issues and to clarify and to define and to think about our language and to recognize that even in the most well-intended situations, we might actually say something that we don't anticipate is going to impact someone in such a way. And when they respond to it uh, and they're impacted by it, troubled by it, inspired by it, whatever, the feedback can be very valuable. Yeah. Uh, and it just strikes me that maybe we need our own collective training one that is um, built around uh, you know a more contemporary moment uh, a more current moment um, you know things have been the same and different in the last five years All right that's a very valid point Rabbi Morantz and that may be something that it's interesting that you thank you Fred because now all of this is making a, more, a bit more sense to me in, one, in this respect and that is that that is something we can do. That is a low hanging fruit that we can do as an organization, as a group in ECRA, is to offer some training now among us clergy. I'm not talking about the congregations, my friends, I'm talking about among us. So who would we want, what type of trainers would you want to have? Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, we should, when you said that, it's like, yeah, that's what we should be thinking about in this is we have a training that we have questions have questions about that happened five years ago, but, but who would we want to come in and do a training with us as an ECRA uh, group, whether it's once a month uh, where we commit, maybe we commit, uh, begin to have conversations around committing time. Uh, maybe one, one of our uh, meetings is just committed to training and we do it but I'm going to push back and say we don't do it once a you know once every five years. But that what if that becomes something we do either once a year or something we do uh, uh, three times a year where we do sensitivity training. And it may not simply be around Black Lives Matter. It may be around uh, our immigrant populations. I'm not talking about having someone come and do a presentation to us, but one that engages us to have some deeper meaning conversations around all of these pieces of structural rep, uh, uh, racism that you have lifted up, Fred. So I'm wondering if that may be something that we, we start thinking about as an action that we can take, because this would be a, a, a good thing. Consistent action over time. Yes, yes.
I know our Senate offers anti-racism training, um, you know, so I could look into that, but I'm sure there's lots of organizations that do it. Well, I think I think be something we'd be bringing to the to the group, right? But I think, yeah, I don't care who I don't care who does the training. But the fact is that we it's one thing that it's one thing for us to say we'll talk about it. But what are we doing? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a great. You've just brought up a very great low hanging fruit we can do, and we could actually do it now because it could be done online during an ECRA meeting, right? If we're training mm -hmm. our group and we're having racism training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I like that. All right. Well, you you brought it up, so <laughs> and you really, you did it. So I guess I did. Uh, yes. Well. Our job, our job, folks, is to open up a can of worms. Exactly. Exactly. Because uh, their lives hanging in the balance, it's the least we could do. Yeah. Right. We have a lot right. of work ahead, and we've got to get into um, these uncomfortable uncomfortable conversations yes so it's okay it's okay again i reiterate nothing but respect just mm. really challenging the ideas uh love love the presenter love our teacher today <laughs> yes thank you fred thank, thank you, you fred. everyone thank you yeah i'm glad you're appreciating this and it's you know even though it's challenging for us so that's yes. great yes all right, what else did I have here? <clears throat> I wanted to have something, uh, yeah. These are some phrases, um, world views, um, that encourage us to act together for social justice, so a little more on the positive side, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, um, who didn't read yet? Um, Reverend Ware, do you wanna read this for us? Sure. Without struggle, there is no progress. Do to others as you would have them do to you. An injury to one is an injury to all. United we stand, divided we fall. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yeah. So you might have heard some of these before, especially do to others as you would have them do to you. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. From all of our good books. Um, also, the last one, Injustice Anywhere is a Threat to Justice Everywhere. I'm pretty sure Dr. King spoke that. I don't know if he got it from someone else or not, but um, that's a famous one. Um, but yeah, these are all like ways of being inclusive, right? And that we're all interconnected and that what we do to another affects us as well. So um, these are ways of thinking about and working towards a world of inclusion and uh, equality, equity for all. So they also, I think, pertain to being anti-racist. And then I wanted to end with this litany of healing. I think there's about four screens of let us, what should we do? Let us do this. Let us um, not rush into this. Um, Sister Mary Jean, you want to read this one? Let us not rush to the language of healing before understanding the fullness of the injury and the depth of the wound. Mm. Let us not rush to offer a Band-Aid when the gaping wound requires surgery and complete reconstruction. Mm. Um, How about Rabbi Morantz? Let us not offer false equivalencies, thereby diminishing the particular pain being felt in a particular circumstance in a particular historical moment. Mm. Let us not speak of reconciliation without speaking of reparations and restorations or how we can repair the breach and how we can restore the loss. Dr. Steinfels. 
Let us not rush past the loss of this mother's child, this father's child, someone's beloved son. Let us not value property over people. Let us not protect material objects while human lives hang in the balance. Pastor Ware again. Let us not value a false peace over a righteous justice. Let us not be afraid to sit with the ugliness, the messiness, and the pain that is life in community together. Amen. 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 So today we've been remembering these four names, Sandra Bland, Rakia Boyd, Alicia Thomas, and Chantel Davis. Thought we could end with this Jewish Kaddish. I don't know if this is okay just to say one in English, Rabbi Morantz. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But I picked one of the three you had from one. No, of this your- is great. This is the uh, this is the the very end of very end of the the prayer. May the one who creates harmony on high bring peace to us, to all people who dwell on this earth. And we say, Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Fred. Thank you all. Fred. Uh, did a great job, man. For a person who who was like, I don't know, you got it down. All right. <laughs> <As we> say, <laughs> Kol Hakavod, all the respect. Yeah. Uh, I was really moved by the litany. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, I must confess uh, to some accountability for doing exactly what I shouldn't be doing. Which uh, is, yeah, in the sense that you know this sort of pursuing peaceful and conciliatory language. Uh, and I think you need to dwell in people's pain first, give them the mm. space to be angry, uh, yes. to be hurt, to feel betrayed. Um, again, you know, uh, it, it's just one of those, when you're committed to anti-racism, you, you know, you need to give people space, you know, because uh, you really run the risk, uh, if not the reality of being sort of a, a Johnny or Jill come lately. Mm. Hey man, I've been suffering for a long time. Where were you then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it just feels so naive sometimes. Uh, as much as I aspire to peace and reconciliation, that's hard earned. Consistency over time. Mm. Right? Absolutely. Trusted to right. be consistent over time. Yeah. And maybe we can start putting out the uh, let's repair and let's reconcile excellent well it's nice to have Fred, you. i'd love that fred can you send me the litany i like that sure yeah yeah that was very nice very nice yeah it's just one Beautiful, honest statement somebody in our church wrote that i found so yeah i thought it was really good too okay. all right I'll send well, well done so uh tomorrow uh 8 a.m and uh, Dr. Steinfels, Jane, will be leading us. And also on Saturday at 8. And then for the record, anybody listening, uh, we're going to move towards uh, uh, 9 o'clock start on Monday. I will fulfill uh, our commitment on Sunday uh, by posting something of, uh, I hope, something meaningful to keep our conversation, if you will, moving forward. Uh, you just have to kind of think about it on your own. Okay. Uh, we'll look forward to getting more people involved come next week. I'm working on, I will confess in front of the group, I'm working on stuff for next week. So uh, oh, we'll get back with you. I'll get back with you tomorrow. God bless you. All righty. Thank you. Uh, hey, struggle great. on, everyone. Stay Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be with Thanks you. again, Fred. All right. Bye, all. See you tomorrow. Bye. Tomorrow. Take care.